Hello everyone, welcome to another video in the How to Brew series. Today we're going to be talking about a little bit of a controversial subject, and that is fake pour. What is it? How do you identify it? Why is it different? Why is it such a big problem? And I think fake can be a little bit of a misleading word and term terminology. What is fake tea? What does that even mean? What does that um, consist of? I think a much better word to use is mislabeled or fraudulent. And this is a very big problem in poor. And to better understand why there's a lot of fraudulent or mislabeled poor, we should understand the market in whole. I've mentioned before, over 97% of poor tea is from smaller bushes and less than 3% is from older tea trees. So with that in mind, there's a very scarce and limited amount of old tea trees. Also, you have to remember what are the two most profitable poor tea categories? What can sellers and businesses profit the most of selling in the poor tea category? That is tea that is made from old or ancient tea leaves can sell the highest price. And two is aged poor. These two teas can be sold at the highest profit and the highest price. So there is strong incentive to keep these teas in stock and be selling them. Now, it's not always the seller or businesses that is at fault. There's a lot of information along the supply chain and things can get misinterpreted or misunderstood. So if I hear something and I purchase tea from a distributor and they tell me it's aged tea, and it's something I don't know for myself to be true or not, and then I tell my customers, that can create a confusion or that can create a problem. So we wanna deeply think about, is the tea we're buying or the tea we're buying that says it is so-and-so, what is the likelihood of that tea actually being what it is claiming? So we'll go over a few techniques about um, what is fake tea, what is fraudulent tea, and why it might happen. So you don't see in the market uh, tea cakes that say from small bushes, Jing Mai tea small bushes, Yi Wu tea small bushes, Shi Shuan Bana small bushes. You almost never see that. But at the same time, over 97% of poor tea is from small bushes. But what you do see very, very often is old, this tea is made from old tea trees. This tea is made from ancient arbor. This tea is made from wild tea trees. These terms are used very commonly and frequently in the market. And that is why I often refer to poor as a buyer's beware market. These terms are flashy, they catch people's attention, and ultimately can be sold to you at a higher price. And it's also more attractive to the consumer because we can purchase something that's very unique and exciting and different. And everyone wants to be able to drink tea from old tea trees. So no tea is claiming that it's from small bushes, yet over 97% of tea is from small bushes. And if we go to the farmer perspective, so if I am fortunate enough to be a farmer who has ancient or old tea trees that has been handed down from generation, I can sell these teas at a very high price and become very profitable. But if I have a tea garden that is predominantly made of small bushes, or maybe I'm just starting, I just have some trees that are 10, 30, 40 years, um, it's very difficult for me to sell these teas at a high price. So small bush teas about two or three years ago, the going rate was about 300 RMB. That's about 50 US dollars. While ancient arbor material can easily be sold for hundreds, sometimes thousands. So if I'm a small farmer and I need to increase my income or my revenue, I would most likely do anything possible to increase the yield of my tea, which is maybe I would be incentivized to use pesticides or herbicides to increase the time I can pick. Maybe I can pick in three, four, five, six times instead of once or twice. Um, so there's a lot of incentive to put pressure to have higher yields. Another thing I might do is I might to adapt the processing of the tea to make a tea that's more aromatic or tasty when it's produced so I can sell a higher price. So let's try a little bit more light on that topic. Only tea made from old tea trees or ancient arbor material, if it follows that special kill green process, so picked, sun-dried, special, special kill green, lower temperature and faster, keeping those enzymes in live, which allows the poor tea to continue its post-fermentation process. 
Only tea from old tea trees and ancient arbor material can be so tasty and aromatic and sweet with a low temperature of Kilgreen process. Teas, most of the time, from smaller bushes, if they do the traditional and necessary step of special Kilgreen, lower temperature, shorter time frame, those teas are not aromatic. They are not sweet, they are not tasty, they are more aggressive, and they do not have such a beautiful fragrance. This is not good or bad. In history, a lot of famous aged tea cakes were from smaller bushes, and this is why traditionally poor tea was always aged 5, 10, 15 years before drinking. Traditionally, poor tea was not consumed when it was very young and raw. Only tea from ancient arbor and old tea trees can be drunk right away comfortably and enjoyably. This is a very important uh, topic to understand. Just recently, with the international demand and people wanting to invest in poor and drink poor, you're seeing this rapid increase of people drinking poor tea young from small bushes. Traditionally, you'd always wait five, ten years because naturally these teas don't have the most beautiful aroma and they're more aggressive when they're first produced. So now we understand old tea trees, very tasty when they're first produced. Small bushes need more time to develop that comfortable and tasty feeling. So if now we have this huge gap in price, old tea trees so expensive, small bush teas much more affordable. And I have a garden at small bushes and I want to sell at a higher price. If I follow the traditional kilgreen process, my tea won't be aromatic and maybe my neighbor can sell their tea 10 times the price I can. But if I can adapt or change the Kilgreen process to make the tea more aromatic and more tasty from day one, I can now sell at a higher price. So this is called manipulating the Kilgreen process. With Kilgreen, if you process a green tea, you use a high temperature, sometimes longer Kilgreen process. The reason you do that is because it brings out more aromatic qualities, more vibrant, beautiful liquid, and sweet characteristics in the taste. You can do this with poor. You can do a high Kilgreen process and essentially make green tea, not poor tea. If you do this, you can get some smaller bushes or maybe not so high quality material and make the aroma so aromatic, so sweet, maybe even confusing some people, making them think this is from old tea trees. But this tea is not poor. This is essentially green tea. This tea has no future but it's very deceiving and difficult to understand if the tea you're drinking did indeed have a manipulated Kilgreen process. One way you can discover that, however, is those teas that use a high Kilgreen process, the Malcha format is very tasty. Even after it's compressed, it's quite tasty. But I mentioned before, when the tea cake is pressed, it traps water vapor. After three months, that water vapor dissipates and leaves the tea cake. And there should be a big change in flavor because the enzymes are alive. The, water's, the water vapor is, is evaporating and the true taste of the tea is emerging. But if the tea had that manipulated Kilgreen process, there will not be a big change. And since there was a high temperature use, those teas don't have a lot of um, enzymes necessary to be able to develop on their own and turn into something really beautiful with age. So these teas will not change month to month. They won't have big changes even after a few years. It's almost like the tea is kind of stale or dead. And sometimes you'll hear things like, oh, that's poor. That's why you need to store teas in a very human environment if they change. Well, if there's no enzymes and there was a high temperature kill green and this tea is almost technically dead or similar to green tea, this tea has no future as poor. So maybe you need to store it in a very human environment to have some kind of change. So remember, if poor tea is of good quality, especially from older tea trees, it should always be changing month to month. It's changing, it's alive. It doesn't need an artificial or extreme storage condition to change. It is alive and ever changing month to month. And there's big changes every year to year. So that's one process to look out for. And that would be one way to, I guess you could say, fraudulently produce poor tea. And that technique is very, very common. <coughs> the 
There was also another technique that's used, and that is one I saw more recently. Now, as time goes on, I see more and more new things, and there's always new techniques being used. And so about a year and a half ago, um, I wrote down in my notes, I said, real fake tea. Now, this is kind of an absurd concept that you're seeing in pork because of the insanity of the prices that some poor tea can be sold for at auctions, etc. There's very, very new high level teas, uh, high level techniques of faking tea. Um, before, even 10, 20 years ago, there was no fake tea, right? There was just good quality and bad quality tea. It was very simple, but now it's so amazing. Not every fake tea is bad tea. This is an important concept to remember. But we need to carefully think, what is poor tea? There was a very famous company, I won't say the name, they're still, they're still selling tea today. They make tea from old tea trees. This is true, they make tea from 100 year old tea trees. But the tea is very weird in recent years. It's very, very sweet, aromatic, and light. The aroma of the leaves is almost too flowery. It's too much flower fragrance. The dry leaves also look a little too dry. That's another thing you want to look for in a tea cake. It should feel alive. It doesn't have to be like moist or wet, but it should feel alive. It shouldn't be stale and dead. So the leaves look a little dry and a little weak. This is because they take a small portion of the material from a very, very light fermentation. So they're taking this raw tea and they're taking a portion of that raw tea and they're doing a light fermentation, right? Almost like black tea. And then they blend it in with the raw material and they make a tea that has so beautiful fragrance. We have to think about that. If they're doing some kind of artificial fermentation like black tea and blending together, how can that tea age well? Because it's not necessarily poor, but it's not necessarily bad tea. So we have to be very careful when we look at each tea and examine, especially if we want to buy more than a few cakes. So that tea may be very enjoyable, but because it's been blended together, why would someone take old tea tree material, which you can already sell at high price, and do something like that, a blended technique of a little bit of fermentation? The reason is you might be able to convince someone that these 100 year old tea trees are maybe 1,000 year old tea trees and sell 10 times the price. So with high prices and as poor tea continues to get more expensive, more scarce, more rare, rare it'll only become more risky, more confusing, and we have to be on guard even more to really evaluate each tea we're drinking. So that's another technique you're starting to see of kind of a mixed light fermentation blending together. Another one you'll see for aged poor, I see this a lot, is people will say, oh, this tea from 1960s, and they wanna share some with me. And at first, from the dry leaves, it looks decent. The leaves are very dark. Um, but after brewed, something really funky happens. One, the tea, I can't really tell if it's ripe or raw. It has kind of a strange taste profile. And when I break up the brewed leaves, I do a few infusions and then I look at it, I notice there'll be black leaves that are very tightly wound, almost like a very uh, strong, ripe pour. And then there'll be leaves that are like brown. And then there'll be leaves that are like amber. And what that is, is someone took a ripe pour and they blended it with a semi-aged raw pour and they put it maybe in a wet storage or even dry storage for a few years and then sold it as very, very, very old pour. Remember with aged pour, the leaf color should be consistent. There should not be black leaves and brown leaves. There should never be black leaves in raw pour. It doesn't matter how old the tea is. Even when I was very fortunate to be able to drink Hong Ying or Red Mark, the leaves after brewing were not black. They were not super condensed and black. They were a kind of a very dark brown and they had life and vibrancy to the leaf. So consistency in the texture of the leaf, consistency in the color of the leaf is very, very important for aged pour. So as I know a common technique, you'll see people take a ripe pour, blend it with a raw and then age for a while and then sell it as a much, much older pour. So mislabeling is a big concern. Paper never refused ink. So be very wary of certain claims and use your own experience. Take notes. 
think deeply about if this tea is of a famous origin or a very old um, tea, how likely is it to be able to be sold at that price point? How likely is it that I'm able to purchase this tea so easily? So those are some of the um, fake and mislabel techniques I have seen in my own experience. There's a number of other techniques that we will continue to see. And of course, if you have questions along the way, feel free to reach out anytime. I want you to take pictures of your tea um, and send them to me. Let me know. Um, and we'll just kind of talk more and more so we can all learn about this and inevitably help us be able to purchase tea more confidently and avoid purchasing tea that may be fraudulent or mislabeled. So I hope you enjoyed this video and just let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much.